This podcast was recorded on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Hello and welcome to The Real Story with Joe Hildebrand, as opposed to The Real Story with Joe Biden. I don't think Joe Biden even knows what the story is, real or not. And he is gone. There is no real story with Joe Biden because there is no Joe Biden. We'll get to that very, very shortly. Also coming up, what's going on with news poll? Now the voters seem to hate Albo and Peter Dutton. They just hate everybody. There might actually be a party that's coming up to try to take advantage of that. Plus, we'll be talking to our very special guest, Tim Blackwell and Michelle Stevenson from this little radio station you might have heard of. It's called Nova. Apparently, they're the biggest show in the country. Anyway, point being, for a while, they were no show at all. The outage came for them and was about to wipe their show off the air. So how did they save it and get on track so that people could actually listen to Fat Boy Slim again? It was almost Armageddon. We'll get to all that very shortly. But first, the biggest story in the world. Now, as the entire world was both incredibly shocked but not at all surprised to learn this week, Joe Biden has pulled out of the race to become the next president of the United States in America. We'll get to all the fallout to that and what that means now with Kamala Harris going up against Donald Trump. But first, I want to have a very quick rant. Now, the only reason why Joe Biden quit the race was not because of some altruistic sense of moral duty or duty to his country or duty to his party. It was because he was forced to. So this is not a heroic act. This is not someone who selflessly put the interests of their country or their party or indeed the free world ahead of their own personal interests. This is someone who, along with those around him in his very inner circle, his immediate family, this was someone who was prepared to hang on until the bitter end by any means they possibly could. And it was only after pretty much Everyone outside his own nuclear family told him that it was time to go, otherwise things really would turn nuclear, that he bows out. And how does he bow out? He doesn't arrange a press conference, arrange a speech from the Oval Office, a telecast to the nation. No, he sends out a tweet. And of course, as soon as he sends out a tweet, everyone is left scratching their heads. Their heads are spinning. Going, what? Hang on. What? I thought he was staying. Just Hours earlier, the co-chair of his campaign was swearing black and blue that he wasn't going anywhere, that he was going to see it through. And then Joe Biden, so selflessly, nobly, honorably, makes a liar out of him, so no one's going to be trusting that guy anytime soon, and puts out a tweet, not a speech, not a formal statement even. He puts out a tweet saying, nah, screw you, I'm out of here. Now, that is something you only do out of spite. It was reported that he was seething. It was reported that his closest advisors only knew he was going to do this mere minutes before he hit send, or rather someone aged under the age of 81 hit send on his behalf. So this is not something that was orchestrated, that was done in conjunction with the Democratic Party or even his own campaign. This was something he just decided to basically slam the door knock out the glass of the window pane and storm off in a huff. Not that he would know which particular direction he was going in, but a huff nonetheless. So let's put paid to this idea that he has performed some noble and heroic act. In fact, it's an act he should have performed weeks ago. No, I take that back. Months ago, so that the party could actually assemble a candidate much stronger than Kamala Harris, who was only going to do about as well as Joe Biden done, probably, but could actually assemble a candidate who had the best chance of beating Donald Trump. That is what you do if you're doing it for your country. That is what you do if you're doing it for your party. But no, he wanted the goodies too much. Or maybe his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, wanted the goodies too much. Maybe she was keeping him there, keeping him warm, so that she could keep her own political ambitions warm. Maybe she just liked the lifestyle. Maybe she just liked the address, Pennsylvania Avenue downtown Washington, D.C. Well, guess what, guys? It's not your house. It doesn't belong to you. Now, this is something that perhaps you might expect of, you know, your average third world despot, you know, tin pot dictator who decides that the presidential palace is their own personal family home. But it's not something that is meant to happen 
in the world's greatest democracy, a democracy that was founded on the very premise that it is the people who should govern. It is the people who office belongs to, not a hereditary royal line. That's what they had a revolution against. But now when it comes to who is the best chance of defeating what they say is the biggest threat to democracy, a.k.a. Donald Trump, let's leave to one side whether they're right or not. But they're the ones out there likening him to Hitler, calling him a dictator. That's what they're saying about him. And yet they're the ones who are clinging on to office for dear life, even though they know that they will almost certainly lose it when it goes to a general election. And they will be handing that house to that guy who they just called a dictator. That is not selflessness. That is the definition of selfishness. And so Joe Biden deserves little to no credit for doing far too late, way after it could actually do much good to the Democratic Party's chances, what he should have done long, long, long ago. And the fact that he did it with a tweet just shows even more contempt because for a few moments, no one even knew who he was endorsing, who the next president was going to be. I mean, everyone knew that it had to be Kamala Harris because as you would have heard, if you'd listened to this podcast a couple of weeks ago, the only person they can go with after Biden is Kamala Harris because she's the only other person on the ticket. And that means that they can keep all the money, the hundreds of millions of dollars that's already been donated. If it has to go to someone else, then suddenly that money is just sitting there in a puddle. It's null and void because it hasn't been donated to the new person. It was donated to the Biden-Harris ticket. So it has to go to Kamala Harris. Otherwise, you kiss goodbye to all the money that's already been donated. But of course, if Biden stayed on, no more donations are coming through. All the donors are saying, nah, sorry, not putting my money on that horse. Anyway, so it goes to Harris. And he actually puts out a tweet a few minutes later saying now he is endorsing Kamala Harris. And of course, that's news to Barack Obama, who probably wants a certain other person quite close to him to be America's first black female president. But anyway, leaving that aside, he then says it's going to be Kamala Harris. This has people worried that it's not democratic and that he's just basically gifting the presidency to someone else, the future presidency to someone else. Of course, she has to then go to the Democratic Convention where all Biden's delegates will still be assembled. So all the people who voted for Joe Biden in the primaries, which there weren't really any primaries because Biden was basically the only candidate, all those people are pledged Biden delegates. And so by him saying that he's supporting Kamala, the idea is that they'll all support Kamala. And you know what? They probably will all support Kamala because everyone else is supporting Kamala, including all her rivals. Yes, everyone else who also wants to be president is supporting Kamala Harris for president. Why? Because they know there is no way in hell she will become president. Because in all the polls, Kamala Harris does, if anything, only marginally better than Biden. In some cases, she does even worse. In some cases, most of them really, it's about the same thing. So there's been a little bit of a bounce, but not much. Kamala Harris is still behind Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, obviously, and his campaign have been preparing to beat Kamala Harris for a very, very long time, just waiting to do what the Democrats should have done a long, long time ago. Now, if you want to know anything about US politics, uh, and this is what, you notice every four years, everyone's suddenly an expert on US politics. It's like when the Olympics rolls around, suddenly every four years, someone's an expert on badminton or, you know, gymnastics or I don't know, what else do they have? Skateboarding? Is that a thing now? Anyway, you go to this website. It's called 538, spelt in words, 538.com. And this is what everyone does. It's the biggest cheat sheet for US politics. You just go there. It's got every single poll that's done anywhere in the country. And then what it does, it shows you each of those polls. Then it will often pull them all together and produce an aggregate of or an average of what all the polls are saying. Now, there is a nice little figure here uh, about whether Americans approve or disapprove of Kamala Harris. And you might be a bit disappointed if you're a Democratic strategist to learn that as of the 23rd of July, 2024, only 37.8% of voters or likely voters approve of Kamala Harris versus 51.4% who disapprove. Now we have a look at Americans who have a favorable opinion of Donald Trump. 
And do Americans have a favourable opinion of Donald Trump? Favourable, 42.3%. However, unfavourable is sitting at a nice fat 53%. So that's no good, is it? If more than 50% of people have an unfavourable view of you, that means you're not getting elected. Um, Fortunately, that is wrong because the people who have an unfavourable view of Donald Trump are not necessarily going to be asked to come out and vote against him. People say, oh, do you like Donald Trump? So, nah, nah, not, no, not really, not my bag. And then they just stay home on polling day. Uh, another interesting figure is, do Americans want Republicans or Democrats in Congress? And this has actually bounced around quite a lot, but a really interesting figure that had just popped up. And strangely enough, it seems to have uh, just flipped, but it's about 50-50, 44 or 44, 44, I should say, 44.7% of people want Republicans in Congress and 44% of people, and this is voters, by the way, not all Americans, as we say, it's a voluntary voting system. So if they just come out or don't come out, that could make all the difference on election day. 44% of people want Democrats in Congress. And even just a few days ago, that had flipped. So there's a lot of people who clearly want to see Donald Trump made president and just deliver a big F you to the system, a big F you to the Democrats who have F'd them around for so long, but don't actually want the Republicans to have control of both houses or maybe even either House of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And so people are splitting their votes. So there will be a large number of people based on those numbers alone who vote Donald Trump for president, but vote in a Democrat for the House of Representatives or the Senate. And that is uh, very interesting and very important because we want to make sure that Donald Trump can't do everything he might want to do when he wakes up in the morning. We have to make sure there's checks on the balances. We've got like literally billions of dollars worth of nuclear submarines relying on Congress to support giving them to us, as has been promised. Another thing that people are suggesting is that Kamala Harris might be great at delivering black voters and woman voters, because she is black and she is a woman. The problem here is that the Democrats already pretty much have those voters in the bag anyway. Uh, Women voters break about 60-40 to the Democrats versus the Republicans, or rather, I should say, 60-40 to whoever is the Democrat to Donald Trump. So Donald Trump already has a woman problem. In fact, there was a piece that said just that uh, earlier this year, that women are fleeing Donald Trump. And if women are fleeing Donald Trump, and by now they've already fled Donald Trump, and he's still winning, he's still ahead of both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, well, they're already gone. He's not relying on them anymore. And black voters, of course, you would think, well, Kamala Harris, black candidate, black voters are going to be more inclined to vote for her. In fact, when Kamala Harris was running for president for all of about five seconds in 2020, running in the Democratic primaries against Joe Biden, who she suggested was a little bit what the French call racist, black voters did not touch her with a barge pole. They ran a mile from her. Now, obviously, those voters may well come back when she's up against Donald Trump. But again, the Democrats already have a virtual monopoly on black voters. In fact, Joe Biden famously joked, said, if you're not voting for me, you ain't black. And that was before he had dementia. And here's another little fun fact about this upcoming election in America that just makes it so amazingly weird and uncanny and blockbustery and just crazy. It is almost a dead repeat of a similar election half a century ago, which was an absolute phenomenon. This was the 1968 US presidential election. And this took place, of course, at the end of the swinging 60s, the protests against the Vietnam War, hippies, flower power, hate Ashbury, Berkeley, you name it, the summer of love. I think that was the summer after 1968. But still, there was a lot of love and there are a lot of summers. And one of the hallmarks of the 1968 uh, election campaign was the Democratic Convention in Chicago, where the toughest brass 
Mayor Daly, a Democrat, but a tough Democrat, got his cops to, you know, bust some hippie skulls because everyone was protesting against the Vietnam War and there were tears and there were anthems and there were folk songs and there were dirty feet, you name it. Anyway, that election was phenomenal for the sole reason that that was the last time a sitting president in their first term, so a sitting president who was eligible to run again, you know, four more years, four more years. It was the first time that the sitting president in their first term was not given their party's nomination to run again. Now, the president in this case was LBJ. Uh, For a while, it looked like Robbie Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, JFK's little brother, was going to uh, challenge him and run against him. In fact, he did run against him, but he was assassinated during that campaign. Uh, but LBJ was not given his party's endorsement. And this was obviously very controversial. And uh, things got really ugly. And they ended up basically shifting to the left because they thought LBJ, oh, he's a warmonger. He's taken us all to Vietnam, ignoring all the other awesome things he was doing in education and civil rights and his war on poverty and some great stuff. But no, the hippie trippy activists left didn't like the fact that LBJ was in Vietnam. Of course, here in Australia, we were all the way with LBJ, as Harold Holt once said. Look what happened to him too. Anyway, so there's this convention where a first-term president has been uh, forced to fall on his sword because he knows he doesn't have the numbers. LBJ does what Joe Biden should have done and delivers an address to the nation from the Oval Office, which is very powerful and very disturbing in many ways. And the Democrats go with another guy who you've probably never heard of. I keep forgetting his name as well. He's called Hubert Humphrey. He gets his Democratic nomination. So the other option, the presumptive candidate, Robert F. Kennedy, Bobby, gets assassinated, and suddenly they're lumped with a guy who no one can remember called Hubert Humphrey. But there's also another candidate in the race running as an independent. This candidate is George Wallace, who is a Southern Democrat. And Southern Democrats are pretty different to other Democrats in that they're pretty big on segregation and racism and white supremacy and all that sort of stuff, right? So this guy, George Wallace, is a hard right segregationist from the South, and he runs as an independent. Now, what is really interesting here is, firstly, what happens in that election, because the Republican candidate is someone you probably have heard of. His name was Richard Nixon. Yes, Tricky Dicky himself, the most infamous Republican president, probably the most infamous president of the United States, full stop. Richard Nixon goes to the polls at the height of of the 60s, at the height of the Vietnam War demonstrations, at the height of flower power, right? And what happens? He gets elected in a landslide. He gets, he absolutely pisses it in. So he gets out of, there are 538 members of the Electoral College. That's 538 kind of, let's say, seats, if you like, in Australian terms. And so for someone to become president, you need to get 270 of those seats, right? 270 is the magic number. Richard Nixon gets 301. Now, that is a pretty huge number at the best of times, but then you compare it to his main rival, Hubert Humphrey from the Democrats, who they swapped out LBJ for, he doesn't even crack 200. He gets 191 electoral college votes. Absolutely nothing, nada, terrible result. And the independent, usually the independents just peel away votes from one of the other two candidates. In this case, our Southern segregationist friend, George Wallace, gets 46 electoral college votes. So Nixon absolutely trounces both of them. Even if the Southern Democrat joined up with the Democrat vote, they'd still only get uh, less than 240 votes. And of course... The Southern Democrat is no friend of the flower power movement. This guy ain't no hippie, right? He doesn't even like black people. He is a nasty piece of work. So the conservative, the right wing vote is actually even bigger. We're talking about 350 votes out of 538 going to conservative or out and out hardcore racist candidates. Now, this happens in the middle of Flower power in the middle of the 60s, in the middle of probably the most famous period of activism known to humankind. What does that tell you? It tells you when you get crazy lefties, crazy activists infiltrating the major parties or dominating politics, people go, yeah, 
and they go conservative. And what have we got going on here in 2024? Well, again, we have probably the second most infamous, maybe Dickie's now the second most infamous Republican president in US history, because we've got the Donald, Donald J. Trump, the man who sends people crazy, the man who invented Trump derangement syndrome, not for himself, but for his opponents. You know, orange man bad. So you've got right now in a period of the most heightened activism probably since the 60s. You know, you've got your Black Lives Matter. You've got your Twitter social justice warriors. You've got your online keyboard warriors, your activists everywhere going on about, you know, they're freeing the nipple. They're doing everything. And what does that produce? Well, in 2016, when it's between Donald Trump and, you know, Americans being asked to prove their feminist credentials and say, I'm with her and elect Hillary Clinton, who gets up? Donald Trump. Then in 2020, when the entire nation, except for Donald Trump, unites against Donald Trump, Joe Biden just manages to get up on the back of a coalition of voters that ranges, again, from Bernie Sanders socialists to Mitt Romney Republicans, right? It can't be overemphasized how broad the anti-Trump coalition was. Joe Biden gets the greatest number of votes in US presidential history. Donald Trump gets the second greatest number of votes in US presidential history, and they're all just for Donald Trump. Now have a think about what is happening in this election coming up. You've got right-wing bogeyman, Richard Nixon slash Donald Trump. Then you've got sudden last dance, last ditch choice from the Democrats, a minute to midnight. Oh my God, we've lost the main one. Who who do we go for? Just whoever's, who's around? Who's answering the phone? Oh, there you go. No one else wants it because it's such a poison chalice. In this case, it's Hubert Humphrey slash Kamala Harris. And then where do we get our sort of former Democrat but now slightly crazy crackpot from. He's right there in front of you guys. Enter RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Bobby's kid. He's come back. And so what is going to happen there? Clearly, anyone who is voting for Trump is already voting for Trump. You don't stick your hand up and tell a pollster you're voting for Trump unless you're really voting for Trump. You know, you would wade through hot lava with this guy. You know, it was only, you know, a little while ago that you would have been a pariah for even suggesting that you were voting for Donald Trump. So if you're voting for him, you're voting for him. Robert F. Kennedy ain't getting your vote, but he might just get votes from those who, "Eh, not too big on Trump, not too big on the Dems. Oh, I don't know, Joe Biden, he's a bit old. Oh, Kamala Harris, a bit annoying. So RFK could peel off Democrats from Kamala Harris and make her chances against Donald Trump even worse than they already are. So again, there you have it, 1968 and 2024, a first term Democratic president who is blown out of office, an evil Republican bogeyman going against him, primed to win in a landslide, and a former Democrat running as an independent just to kind of twist the knife. You heard it here first. Or... 56 years ago. And now back home to another election that's coming up, ours. Yes, I know Australian politics is nowhere near as fun as American politics, but you know what? It's our politics, so we might as well talk about it. And something to talk about this week is a special news poll that was conducted for the Australian on who voters liked as a leader on who they liked as a prime minister, not quite sort of preferred prime minister, but they basically put forward a whole bunch of names and said, who do you like as leader of our country? And Peter Dutton and Anthony Albanese were tied. Amazingly, just 28% of voters each nominated them as their preferred leader. And the other votes all got scattered to the four wins. One really interesting one was Jacinta Price, who I have a massive crush on. I love her. And I, in fact, did a story with her that ran this week as well uh, that basically said what she would do if she was prime minister. And you know what? That might happen because 14% of people say they would like to see Jacinta Price as prime minister. But basically, this story is a story that voters have been telling pollsters and indeed have been expressing at the ballot box for years and years and years now, which is that the two-party system is fracturing. It used to be that the coalition and Labor would get about 40% or above 
uh, in their primary vote and a couple of, you know, the Greens and the Democrats or whoever it might be, even One Nation uh, more recently would get a bit and then those votes would eventually flow back. These days, parties are getting just sometimes even low 30s as their primary vote. So uh, the coalition primary vote in this latest news poll went up by two points. It got to 38. That's, of course, for both the Liberal Party and the National Party, whereas Labor's uh, ticked up. So again, it went up one point to 33. And of course, this is why Labor relies on all those Greens' preferences. The problem is the Greens ain't playing nice no more. The Greens have now said openly, and they've been saying it for some time, but they're really aggressively declaring it. They're shouting it from the rooftop now that they want to eat out Labor. They want to attack Labor from the left, take its seats, and replace it as the party of opposition. The Greens seem to think that this would uh, mean that they would be the dominant party in a coalition between themselves and the Labor Party. But they also seem to admit that they have to win in their own right because they know that Labor would just do preference deals with the Liberal Party. So they can't even seem to make up their own mind what they're trying to do or what the outcome would be. And of course, Labor wants as little to do with the Greens as possible, even though it does rely on Greens voters preferencing the Labor Party ahead of the Liberal Party. So it's pretty ugly. We've had the Greens housing spokesman, Max Chandler-Mather, come out this week and say he wants the value of your house to go down. Yes, he wants people's primary, most people's primary investment, the one thing they own, it's pretty much all I own, the house or the bank owns, uh, they want the value to go down, which of course could be economically catastrophic, but then again, so could so many Greens policies. Now, an interesting thing, I uh, have been talking to another group of people, and you'll hear more about this next week, who are plotting to do to the Greens what the Greens are doing to the Labor Party. And they're doing it, and have already kind of, you know, kind of sort of nibbling a bit here and there. They can do it by taking votes off the Greens, but also taking votes off other minor parties like One Nation. What sort of a behemoth takes votes off the Greens and One Nation? You'll find out all about that next week. And of course, the other big story this week, the other thing that happened was the thing that didn't happen, i.e. pretty much everybody's computers. Sucks to be a Povo Microsoft user. The outage. Uh, this, of course, wiped out uh, just about every uh, computer device that wasn't uh, owned by an Apple-loving hipster. And one of the people affected is sitting before me right now, despite the fact he is an Apple-loving hipster. <laughs> uh, you might know him as one-third of the popular Nova Drive show, Tim and whoever else is his co-host this week. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about Ricky Lee, Tim and Joe, aren't you, Joe? That is what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is yeah. what I, I can't keep up. I'm no, too old for this I stuff. Know. We're both, um, just so the listener can picture in their mind, we are both middle-aged men mm-hmm. wearing Adidas Samba shoes. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Just, who wore it better? We'll put a little poll up on better. our Instagram. <laughs> um, the difference is that Tim is carrying a one-litre Stanley Cup and I am not. Guess what? This is Pip Edwards endorsed too. P and oh, Asian. Oh, that, look that, at that's you how bougie go. I am. <laughs> Does that mean you have to go to North Bondi, the outdoor yeah, gym, yeah, yeah. and just you know just do a few squats? Yeah, a kai bowls. But um, a sigh. What on, what was going on? Because I know at the Telegraph, um, yeah. the paper nearly didn't come out. The editor was actually on leave and came back in. To, oh, tens of people would have been destroyed tens, by that. Tens of people <laughs> were disturbed. At Sky, um, it's <laughs> big, the big future in newspapers, by the way. A lot going on. We've got some, we got some big ideas. We're going to now deliver them by horse and cart. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Just I to really that. tap into that market. Um, With Sky, a litre of milk in a glass <laughs> bottle. That's, that's right. <laughs> Sky News, my uh, TV channel I work for from time to time, uh, yep. they, I think, nearly went off the air for a while or did go off the air for a while. And for a, a solid, you know, 15 minutes, I didn't know what was Chris Bowen's fault. <laughs> <laughs> did you think like us, though, because we were that up ourselves yeah. that we thought we personally had been hacked? So I was walking yeah. around like at 3.30 going, 
Southern Cross on stereo have hacked us, yep, yep, or right. Kiss have finally decided right. to get us off the air today, and so you really make it really about you. That's right. And then you realise, oh no, it's not about us at all. That's <laughs> it's right. It's the well, world. It's just like everyone, everyone else in the world. Like I was actually at Cole's supermarket, and uh, I was doing. We've totally run out of food. Hang on, is this a bit like where were you when you found out Diana died? Like That's this right. is going to be the new story. Strangely, I was also at Cole's supermarket <laughs> when Diana died. I now- love your shopping. <laughs> don't you? That's right. Well, just- I've now got PR people on it. For the love of God. <laughs> Just could you just not go to the shops this week? Yeah, Got a big gig on. We need a break. <laughs> we need a break. Can't handle the tragedy. But um, but yeah, and the announcement came over the loudspeaker. Can everyone please evacuate the self serve checkout? And I'm like, oh, that's of a, course. But don't you think evacuate is quite a, a strong, strong word? Yeah, for yeah, that's right. A tech- I'm like. Awesome. Finally, I'm going to be in the front row of a terror attack. You know, BBC is <laughs> going to be calling me up and saying, where were you when you lost your legs? <laughs> you know, <I'm> the- <laughs> I was buying out trust tomatoes. That's, but that's putting them right. through as regular tomatoes. <laughs> well, there, there very nearly was a terror attack because um, we had so run out of food. We were literally doing like a 500 and something dollar shop. Like it was huge. It was, the trolley was overflowing. I was stacking things on my son's head and saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry yeah, up. Yeah. And so we're there at the normal checkout. So the, only the manned checkout. I yeah, don't know if you can say The good that. old days. The person, the person checkers, checkouts, yes. The chicks checkout. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we're there and it's like a mountain of food, like, you know, a month's supply for a family. And then suddenly all these people from the self-serve checkout come over and there's like someone with just like, you know, one can of baked beans standing behind me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'd let you through, yeah. but, you know, we, we were here for... And it's yeah. an emergency. And it's an emergency. Yeah. But anyway, so what, what goes through your head when that happens? So we were, it was about 10 past three in here and I was here because I've been here for 23 years. Yes. So I wear, I've always been just here. Yeah. And uh, Jermaine, our, our tech guy, said, oh, Black, said, like, the computers are down. And I made one of those real like classic, like I put my sambas up on the desk and I said, oh, as long as you've got microphones, mate, uh, yeah, we've got a right. radio show, you know, <laughs> old school. And it's all right, mate, I'll panel it myself. And it turns out it was true. So, look, uh, yeah. without sledging our competitors, basically, um, Kiss, I think, had a pre recorded show already. Right. So, they were able to put some of that to air. A lot of the people had emergency tapes going. What I loved about our techs, Robbie, Luke, and Lockie, firstly, how thankful I was they didn't have plans on Friday night so they could <laughs> stick around and help us yeah. out. Thanks to the text. But they kind of put all their efforts into getting us on the air more than fixing the problem. Yes, so good. So I called Ricky, Ricky yep. Lee, yep. Uh, and she came in early. So it was about, we, got, we got on air about 3.40. And I'm sitting r- right where I was now. And Brendan, our boss, said, look, I'm going to patch you in. It's going to be two microphones and your laptop. Are you okay with that? And I said, yeah, I'm okay with that. So I had to turn all my incognito browsers off. And <laughs> turn on safe mode. Turn on safe mode and load up my Spotify. So what was happening yeah. was I had one fader, for anyone who, who understands, like I had only one fader to work with. There was no cross-fading, double song hits. We're playing songs and just talking. Um, Amazing. And then we got this promo out of it. Friday. An unprecedented global IT outage shut down computers across the world. Major breaking news. Affecting millions of people across the globe. 8.5 million devices. Biggest IT outage ever. Some of the billboards in Times Square here went dark, 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 dark. Bringing everything from banks, airlines and essential services to a screeching halt. Oh, hello, Ricky Lee. Oh, hello, Tim Blackwell. <laughs> well, almost everything. Um, it's Friday afternoon and there's been a little incident. The entire system is down. We, we are down all around the country and we're in control of the music. We are the captains um, of this ship. I have my laptop connected to the network. This is terrifying because I know what you look up on your laptop. <laughs> When things go wrong, when the world is crumbling down around you. Well, as long as the mics work, we've got a radio station. You can always rely on Ricky Lee, Tim and Joel. Weekdays from four. So we'll be mil- milking this for you. That is amazing. <laughs> That's made me believe again. Yeah. I, I believe in free-to-air radio oh, again. Yeah, well, there was no this ads. This podcast thing, nothing's <laughs> yeah, no. Well, yeah, so, it was that, so there was no ads. So I was actually So you could compete with the ABC. Finally, Finally, right? How do you cook the perfect steak? <laughs> Uh, text in now. <laughs> so we, we're getting texts and DMs. And then the other thing was um, we had the Nova Player app, which your podcast yep. is also available on, and people couldn't hear it through there because it was that much of an outage. So we were using Jermaine, our socials guy, to actually push people to broadcast. So people were having to go 
and sit in their cars to listen. And then Ricky's husband, Rich, they didn't have an actual radio in their house. So he went to JB Hi-Fi real quick in the city, <laughs> bought, bought a radio, radio and then listened to us. This is an insight into how humanity is going to live after the electromagnetic pulse comes <laughs> yes. and wipes out all technology. Yeah. And you'll be you'll be there on I'll the desert. You'll be there on the <laughs> desert island building your ham radio out of wood. <laughs> I felt like Christian Turning Slater. That's right. <laughs> pump up the volume. That's right. <laughs> But can I get Michelle? Because Michelle yes, Stevenson, do you want to grab yes. her from? Because uh, thank God for her. Because I, I actually even we had the old school Nova uh, news theme, which was right here, yep. right now by Fat Boy Slim. I was playing that, and then we're only on air in Sydney at the start. About half an hour later, Melbourne came on board, then Brisbane, then Adelaide, and then we didn't get Perth. But the facts belong to, to this lady here, Michelle Stevenson, first time <laughs> caller, long time listener. I mean, well, we know One, each other pretty well. We though. know each other very, very well, and I knew. <laughs> are, I you knew wearing, that- are you wearing the midlife crisis <laughs> shoes like both oh of us? Oh my god, yes! <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> <Light>. much. <laughs> We're all wearing Sambas. It's so incredibly yeah, sad. Yeah. No wonder we're all single. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, hang on. I'm married. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Wait, yeah. hang on. <laughs> anyway, it's only a matter of time. Um, point being, you yeah. are you are the sensible one. You are yeah. the, the news boss lady. Yeah. You know? And well, what kind you, of, sometimes. What do you do when the biggest news story is something that has killed the news. Yeah. Well, we do what we do best. We just put the mics on and just riff about it. Yeah. But, like, honestly, what was really complicated for me was I had information. I was armed only with an iPhone and I had information coming in. But, of course, we can't really delineate in what is true and what is is fact and what is fiction at this point. So it's pretty much like all 21st century (laughs) media then. (laughs) Although the first thing you did tell me was stop blaming Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I mean, it, it did affect. Microsoft, but you know, I, there was rumors that it was CrowdStrike. But for me too, I couldn't like kind of say it definitively was CrowdStrike until mm. I had other people reporting on that. And as also well. t- until you've checked who all your sponsors are. No, so, that's yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> CrowdStrike. Are they one of us? No, no, okay, yeah, those bastards <laughs> but destroying I, humanity. But ironically, one of the things that I had said, I'm like, well, we all know the right wingers are going to say it is something to do it's with China. Trump. Of course, it's, no, or no, oh, it's something no. to do with Trump. And They're trying to shut him down. Trying to shut him down because the Republican convention was on. And ironically, I started seeing on Twitter that night they was they were linking the head of CrowdStrike with the Democrats. But, <laughs> but, like, but who's, who's is it? Is it the Democrats? Is it Zelensky? Oh, it's is everything. it NATO? It is is everything. I mean, it's it's got to be somebody. Is it Carmela? <laughs> <laughs> you can only say that name in America. It's got to be it? huge. I know. I don't think it exists in any other accent. <laughs> Carmela. I don't think Carmela has ever. <laughs> It's, Actually, like, it's like Craig. It's, it's like, like I can't say like Craig. Craig's list. It's like, but also, I love I love how when it first came on the scene because everyone says Kamala, which is wrong. It's Kamala. No, it's Kamala. Yeah. And and when she first came on the scene four years ago, there were there were almost like kind of like explainers on how to pronounce it. Mm. Yeah. And the closest anyone could get was, it's like Pamela, but if Pamela was pronounced Pamela. <laughs> And that's how you get to Carmela. She's not even normal name adjacent. <laughs> She's like two steps away before you get there. And it, it still like, doesn't even make sense. When that guy from 90210 came out and we had to call him Iron Zeering, his name's Ian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what's going on with American names? That's know. because they all like to, like, strippers like to name their children, like all their daughters are named with, like, Brandy, but yeah. like spelled B W, you know, underscore. It's, uh, <laughs> underscore. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. 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 It's B-R-A-A-N-D-I. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. totally. You are, as you correctly pointed out, uh, one third of the Ricky Lee, Tim, and Joel show. You mm-hmm. never seem to get your name first. No. No matter what, how you know, <laughs> no. how many changes, you're always just sort just of in stuck, the middle, stuck, stuck in, the middle. in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're kind of the leader, aren't you? You're the matrix. You, you know, you. I do can your say magic. that because they're not here. No, exactly. That's right. Yes, yes. And it's not like this is going to be recorded and broadcast in any any way. No, no, no. It's, that's it. It's not what we do here. No, I at can't. least not that Friday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you know how to do all the technical stuff. Yeah, whereas 100%. they're they're the you know. Yeah, so that was the thing. I was in here, but literally, I had my laptop with an ox cord. Remember those parties where you used to? They called ox cord politics, where it's like my turn now. They go stick your ox cord in to play the music. I think we went to different parties. <laughs> well, I was playing music out of the uh, out of my Spotify, and then I had my phone just like you did, and mm. then that was it. I, and when Jermaine, our, our um, social guys, was here, Ricky was over there, and Michelle was over there, and it was literally like this little hectic. And did you feel unit. a bit? I felt so powerful. Yeah, I was so yeah, annoyed yeah, yeah. actually that um, at six o'clock, Ricky and I were like, "Let's order some pizza, let's get a pot of coffee on. We're staying here till midnight." Yeah. yeah. Like, no, no, the next show's ready to go. I'm like, oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> we were so ready to continue. So annoyed. <laughs> but you must have felt like you know I've been waiting twenty years. This is my time. Yeah. 
This is now well, you're going to see. You you know, you fly by night as you swan in, you make a couple of jokes, yeah. you walk out, you think that's radio. No, mate. No, this is radio. This is radio. It's a masterclass. The other times I think was obviously when COVID started, we came mm. in here and did like these yep. long shows. I got, got Carl in and everyone, and just to help out for favours, and then everyone came in every weekend anyway because it was yeah. fun. <laughs> right. But then the, the other time I felt really powerful with radio was within the Queensland floods because I did uh, the Brisbane breakfast show during the floods. And Nova 106.9 got flooded, yep. and you weren't allowed on the streets. There were army kind of army mm. tanks and stuff like liaising with people on the street. So we got we got escorts to the studio. We went to four BC or four KQ or yeah, something, BC. something with a K. No, it wasn't BC. No. It was something, something with a K. It was worse than BC. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we were like in this little bunker broadcasting there. So radio is like it's always it's always the medium that people turn to. Because we can literally plug in from a laptop and broadcast it around the country. That's right. At the end of Terminator 3, when the nuclear bomb is activated by the machines and they're trapped in the underground bunker, mm. where does the message come? It comes from right. There's no TV there. We did go to different parties, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> But, it is, but, you do, but you do see the power of radio and this is what we live to do. This is why we choose radio because we know it is a medium. There's an immediacy to it. You yes. get to talk directly to the listener. Podcasts like are good too because they can talk about it a week later. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned mm. something well, something very podcastery, which is you are armed only with an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. As as. as did you mean that ironically or? No, literally because like, of course we had no access to computers. But do you, do you, do you feel like, like, I don't want to get it all boomer on you. Yeah. But like, like there is more computing power in an iPhone now than there used to be in like all of, right. all of the Pentagon. But I'm, I was literally, I didn't, I couldn't type anything. I couldn't do anything. I was literally reading news and going between pages and scanning oh, and reading and doing ad libbing yeah. at the same time and making it sound like it was a proper news bulletin. Yeah. Okay, yep. Okay. It's the I'll, art of you like. You did have Fat Boy Slim underneath. Do you remember that? That was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and Tim was, <laughs> I think for, I think he was just trying to like make sure I could do my job without laughing. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. like, I he's like, I'm going to throw Fat Boy Slim while you read your news. Yeah. I would have preferred the Jesus Jones right here, right now, as in there's no other oh. place I'd rather be. Oh, yeah, that's a nice one. Oh. That is a good yeah. song. Yeah. That is good. Just, just for, for next time? Yeah, yeah. Not a criticism, just a for next time? For next but, time. For the next worldwide do, power outage. I, do you think the art of, of what we did on Friday is that no matter how hard we may have been working, like our legs were working, the on top part was still quite yeah. calm and... Oh, yeah, no one seemed to be stressed. No one which was, was stressed. Because everyone just did their job. Like a duck. Yeah, like, yeah. like literally go. like a duck. Yeah. You're literally like, you know that you've got this. You've worked so many years in radio knowing what you do and it yeah. just was able to make it happen. And then afterwards you were like a duck in Chinatown. Yeah. <laughs> that completely cooked. cooked. <laughs> so cooked. From I was duck. exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging in a window somewhere. <laughs> Done. <laughs> And now to my favourite part of the podcast, it's question time. Get it? Because, like, it's about politics and questions. politics is question time and you have your question and you get to ask me questions and that's what time it is. It's time for you to ask the question. Now, Elise from Instagram has written in. She says, hi, Joe. Hi, Elise. I don't know much about Kamala Harris. What does she stand for? Why is she liked or unliked? It's a very good question, Elise. So uh, Kamala Harris has basically done... Not much at all except be a loyal Joe Biden vice president. She owes her entire political survival to him. She did not pick up, I don't think, a single vote in the Democratic primaries. She performed so badly that she dropped out almost instantly. And then it is said, obviously very unkindly, um, that Joe Biden picked her because as an old white male, he needed a younger black female to kind of balance out the ticket and that she was a diversity pick. I don't think that's entirely fair because before Kamala Harris did appallingly at the Democratic primaries, she was touted as the next big thing. I remember we had a futurist on Studio 10 back in the day who said that uh, Kamala Harris would be president, otherwise the world would end or something like that. Anyway, he's kind of almost, you know, halfway getting to be right, but I don't think that will happen. Um, unless, of course, Joe Biden decides he can't even continue to be US president anymore, let alone the candidate for president next time around. Kamala Harris had uh, one job. She had one job, and that was to control the flow of illegal migration on the southern border of the United States, the border with Mexico, the famous border that Donald Trump was, of course, going to build a wall from one end to 
the other of. If you ask Donald Trump, he did build the wall. I don't know if anyone else can see it, but apparently it's magically appeared. Um, and apparently Joe Biden tore down that wall, like Ronald Reagan told Mikhail Gorbachev to do. Point being, uh, there is a huge influx of uh, migration from or rather through Mexico to the United States. This is something that makes people very, very anxious, as I'm sure you can imagine, as it does here. And this is something that Donald Trump brings up in just about every single uh, appearance he makes, every single speech he makes, you know, whatever subject he's talking about, he manages to introduce illegal migration into because it is such a hot button issue. And Kamala Harris's job was to stop that from happening. So the one big job she had, she was colloquially referred to as the border czar, and that czar did not do whatever czars do. It didn't work. So other than that, her values, generally speaking, um, are, you know, she's been described as sort of a typical Californian progressive, which again is the sort of stuff that people uh, in middle America, you know, the flyover states they're sometimes called because people from California and New York only know them from flying over them from one to the other, um, is the sort of stuff that tends to turn those people off, which is why, again, she's trailing uh, Donald Trump in these swing states of traditional blue-collar workers that were once Democrat voters but have now flipped to the Republicans. So the Good news, I suppose, for all that is that Kamala Harris almost has, apart from the border uh, schmozzle that she's uh, presided over, uh, she almost has a kind of clean slate to sort of reinvent herself and to say, right, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. But a lot of the time when she sort of does that, she uses these inane phrases like, you know, leaving the past behind to build the future. And it's just terrible. She sounds like she sounds like Meghan Markle. It's just awful. But anyway, maybe she can turn that around. Matthew from Sanctuary Point has written in. Hi there, Joe. Hi there, Matthew. The Dems seem to be really pushing the youth vote. Do you think this will have an impact? That is an excellent question. And the most important thing in a US election is not just to get people to vote for you. It's to get people to vote at all. It's called getting out the vote. And again, they have a voluntary voting system, unlike here, where we have a compulsory voting system. So in Australia, and this is what makes us very, very stable as a democracy, but also kind of a bit boring sometimes, but still, even the most apathetic person has to go out, get their name crossed off the roll, and then as long as they're there, they might as well vote. And virtually everyone does. There's a handful of, you know, way over 90% of people vote. You don't have to. Once you've got your name crossed off the roll, you can donkey vote. You can write something on the ballot paper and stick it in if you know. You can draw a cock and balls. You can do whatever you want. And nobody's going to know it's you because, of course, it's completely anonymous. But your name gets crossed off the roll and you don't get your $20 fine or whatever it's up to these days. In America, often a bit over 50 or 60% of people will actually even show up to vote. So what you want to do is get people energized. Often that means getting people angry or getting people worried about something that's going to happen. And that's why issues that never pop up in politics here dominate American elections. And one of those issues I just mentioned is illegal immigration. Another one is, of course, abortion. This is something that gets people really, really fired up. People are either really, really pro-life or they're really, really pro-choice. And that gets out the vote. And you can expect that to be a hot button issue. And another uh, one is, of course, guns. And, you know, most people in America would probably support greater gun control. But the people who demand access to their guns, that will be the most important issue to them. So they will come out and they will vote on that issue and they will vote for whoever gives them what they want on that issue. So it's not necessarily most people, but it's people who will vote on that issue and that issue alone. And that makes that a really hot button issue. You've asked about um, the youth vote. Um, Yes, obviously you want to get, and the Democrat machine has traditionally been very good at this. Barack Obama's campaign was really, really good at this, about uh, getting out the youth vote, getting people to donate very small amounts, getting, instead of just focusing on a few big donors donating huge amounts of money, focused on millions of people donating just five bucks or 10 bucks. That was a strategy that Barack Obama used. And of course, getting the youth involved is really important because they're you know, generally more politically active, they're younger and more energetic. Um, getting them out to vote and getting them involved is vital to any democratic campaign. In fact, Donald Trump's shooter donated 
uh, money to just such a campaign, a Democrat adjacent campaign that was all about getting out the youth vote. And he donated $15 to that as a uh, teenager. And so it's vital to that. The youth vote overwhelmingly favours Democrats. So basically, if young people come out to vote, it will probably favour the Democrats or almost certainly will favour the Democrats more. But again, whether or not Kamala Harris inspires them to do that is another question. Uh, One interesting thing is the forgiveness of student debt. So that was another big Biden slash now Harris policy. So that is something hopefully that has endeared them to young people or young college students who, again, would be much more um, inclined to vote for the Democrats. So, you know, they will be hoping that. Whether it's enough, I'm not sure. And that is all we have time for today. Another chock block episode. Thank you so much for listening to The Real Story. If you love what you hear as much as I love doing it, please leave a rating and a review. If you want us to cover anything at all on the podcast, reach out via our socials, via email, therealstory at novapodcast.com.au, or you can slide into my DMs on the IG. My handle on Instagram is at joe underscore hildebrand, and I can assure you that... It is far more G-rated than it just sounded. And if you want to get more from me, you can check out my columns in the Daily Telegraph every Monday and Saturday. Thanks very much. Take care, and I'll chat to you next week.